Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Lauren Gorn. And I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And today, we're getting enthusiastic about possession, using things like have and of and apostrophe s, and how different languages do possession differently. But first, next month is our eighth anniversary. We've been making Lingthusiasm for eight years with you, and we're still excited to keep making it. As part of the anniversary celebrations, we're running the final listener survey in our trilogy of surveys. We have a new set of linguistics experiments for you to do, and we use these surveys to shape topics and ideas for the show. As one example, we had really good response to our linguistics advice bonus episode that we did last year. So you can also use this year's survey to ask us your pressing linguistics advice questions for a potential future advice episode. You can suggest linguistically interesting books for us to read and maybe comment on. And we have further refinements on the Buba Kiki experiment and more. You can hear about the results of the last two years of surveys in bonus episodes that we'll link to in the show notes, and we'll be sharing the results of the new experiments next year. We have had ethics board approval from La Trobe University, which is Lawrence University, for this survey, so we can use the results in linguistics research papers as well. But the ethics board is only for three years, so this is your last chance to be a part of the Lingthusiasm listener survey. If you did the survey in a previous year, First of all, thank you. And secondly, yes, you are still allowed to take it again if you want, and there are new questions. To do the survey or to read more details about it, go to bit.ly slash lingthusiasm survey 24. That's all one word, no spaces, no capitals or anything. Or you can follow the links from our website and social media. Our most recent bonus episode was all about communicating with aliens. Mm -hmm. We discussed how alien languages might work, how we might try and make sense of them based on how existing human and animal communication systems work, and how we would plan to pack enough batteries for xenolinguistic fieldwork. Go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm to get access to the xenolinguistics episode and way more bonus episodes, and to help keep the show running ad-free. On today's episode, we'll be discussing... Ooh, can I say it in my witch voice? Yes, you can say this in your witch voice. Eye of newt and toe of frog, wool of bat and tongue of dog, adder's fork and blind worm sting, lizard's leg and howl its wing, for a charm of powerful trouble... Like a hell broth boil and bubble. <laughs> Those lines come from Shakespeare's play Macbeth, particularly the witches who feature in Macbeth. And not only is it scene settingly spooky, but it is doing something important grammatically for this episode. So Eye of Newt and Lizard's Leg are both. One of these constructions has an of in it, I of newt, and the other one has the apostrophe s, lizard's leg. But So these are two constructions that are both doing a similar thing grammatically. They're indicating this relationship between these two things, the newt and the eye, and the lizard and the leg. And so we can have different constructions doing the same thing. And this thing is about a relationship between two entities. So I of newt, or lizard's leg is a kind of part-whole relationship where the eye is part of the newt. But then there's also charm of powerful trouble, which is not the same relationship as the eye of the newt. It's not that the trouble has a charm. So in this case, it's using the same of to be part of the description. And there are a whole host of other possible relationships that can be expressed by of or apostrophe s. So we could talk about the witch's spell book. Is that the spell book that the witch owns, or is she the author of the spell book? This is one of the things about something like a book. Is this my book that I wrote, or my book that I just happen to be reading right now? So one is a a purchase or ownership relationship, and one is one of the ownership of the ideas rather than physical possession. You can also have interpersonal relationships, the wizard's apprentice, Mm -hmm. my apprentice, my mentor. And I like that with these, sometimes the interpersonal relationships are equal. So if you're my friend, then I'm your friend. And some of them have asymmetrical relationships. So 
the mentor has an apprentice. Or something like the witch's cat, the witch's familiar, or maybe the cat, the cat's witch, hmm. uh, depending on whether you're taking the point of view of the cat. I guess when it comes to, I mean, with cats in particular, it's quite difficult. But when it comes <laughs> to, say, pets, there's a kind of reciprocal relationship, but there is a, an assumption of ownership on behalf of the pet owner. But sometimes, you know, people refer to themselves as being their cat's parents or their cat's, you know, their cat's humans and stuff as well. Yeah, I'm sure there are plenty of cats that don't feel like they are owned by anyone. <laughs> Particularly cats. And something like the school of magic, the magic isn't even aware of owning the school. Like, the, 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 it's just an association of a school with magic. Or the color of the toadstool. It's about the characteristic. Or something like the cauldron of silver. The cauldron is made out of silver. A vial of poison. The poison is contained in the vial. The vial is not made of poison. So the cauldron of silver and the vial of poison have different relationships there. One that I really like is constructions like tomorrow's weather. Mm. Because it's really clear that that's just a weather that has an association with tomorrow. It's not that tomorrow somehow possesses the weather because these are both sort of abstract concepts and what would that even mean? Yeah, or just a kind of general relationship of proximity. Like the demon of the night is not owned by the night. You can't really say the night's demon or Zelda's legend. <laughs> do you mean legend of Zelda, like the video game? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I think I think demon of the night works in this sort of ownership relationship if it's K-N-I-G-H-T. Oh, yes. And they're like best buds or, you know, enemies to lovers, 20,000 words. A whole different genre. <laughs> a whole different genre than demon of the N-I-G-H-T, which is mm -hmm. a demon that goes, woo, out of the night. Something like the Philosopher's Stone or Dracula's castle, where it's sometimes about ownership or just attribution. I mean, Dracula definitely didn't build the castle. Maybe Dracula did build the castle himself. Maybe he's a, a multi-skilled vampire. I think with the Philosopher's Stone, there's this idea that the philosopher, the alchemist, was the one who created the stone, but then people have been trying to find the Philosopher's Stone and take it for themselves as well. Yeah. And Frankenstein definitely created Frankenstein's monster. That's the whole premise of the book. That's very true, yes. And, and then you have these very abstract relationships, something like the haunting of the house, hmm. where the house is haunting. Again, this is a relationship between these two nouns, but it's it's not clear that like the haunting belongs to the house or the house belongs to the haunting, whichever way you put it. I also like that sometimes the thing that is being possessed can just be kind of left in context. So like if you had a witch named Griselda who opened up a cafe, you could just call it Griselda's. Yeah. And and even if you did call it something more fanciful, people who who know you and know that it's your cafe might still call it Griselda's Griselda's Cafe, Griselda's House. Oh, I'm going over to Griselda's this evening. Hmm. And in context, you you know where that where that means. And sometimes it's about location. So Count von Count of Sesame Street. He is not possessed by Sesame Street. It's just his location. The ghost of Christmas past is mm. associated with Christmas past. I don't know really possessed by or located in quite works. Wicked Witch of the West is another one of those. Yeah, I, I think located in, in the West. So we have all of these different relationships that are marked using the same grammatical form, but the relationships can be quite different. It's not necessarily about ownership or power necessarily. Yeah. And in fact, there was one statistical investigation of this, this type of relationship to see how many times is it used to represent like, I own something, this is my cup. And how many times is it used to represent other types of relationships or associations between words? And this study from 1940 by someone named Fries found that it was only about 40% that were actually something like my cup, where I could be argued to own the cup. Hmm. There were 60% of these uses were something like tomorrow's weather or the haunting of the house, where there really isn't straightforwardly a possessive or ownership relationship. And yet, that being said, Grammatically speaking, people often still use the word possessive or sometimes the the term genitive to refer to this whole category of relationships, even though the majority of them are, don't necessarily express possession. And we're talking about grammatical possession, not spiritual possession, but I'm determined to see how many haunted and spooky examples we can fit into this episode. <laughs> 
<laughs> they do have a a common origin, the idea that, you know, maybe an evil spirit might be in possession of your body. And they're almost as old. They're both from around the 1500s, both uses of the word. Huh. Fascinating. I didn't realize that they both went back to the same point. So possession is such a cool grammatical relationship. Mm -hmm. So it's such a spooky grammatical relationship <laughs> <laughs> that because this general concept of sort of a range of meanings around the association between two or more nouns is found in a whole bunch of languages. But there's lots of different subtle ways that languages do this general category of relationships in different ways. So some languages just straight up have things that can't be in a possession relationship. Generally, you get things like rivers or stars can't be in one of these possession constructions, or you have things that have to be possessed. So in a language, you might typically see obligatory possession on domestic animals, but you can't use it for wild animals. I mean, I think, like, I'd be pretty surprised to see someone talking about, like, my sun or my moon in maybe a sufficiently sci-fi context where you have, like, people living on different planets and different solar systems to be like, well, our moon is like this and your guys' moon over there on your planet or your three moons are like that or something like that. But I think this is pragmatically a bit odd in English, even if grammatically, like, you can say it. It's just like, what would you mean by that? Hmm. One example of this, which is a more sort of formal constraint and less about the particular meaning, is that in Warani, which is an indigenous language of Paraguay, there are certain types of nouns, including animal names, where you can't just say something like my chicken the way you can say like my mother. You have to add an additional word. In this case, for a word like chicken, it's a word that means basically pet. So instead of saying my chicken, you have something like my pet chicken to indicate that it's this animal now belongs to the category of things that could be possessed. Hmm. And so it's not so much about like, you know, people can't possess animals because they're fine to say my pet chicken. You just need this additional word added in to do that. And people find it confusing or sound strange if you don't put that word in. The flip side is that there are languages where you will have a word that can't be used without the possessive construction. So in Seko Padang, which is a Austronesian language spoken on the island of Sulawesi, which is part of Indonesia, there's a really great noun that means basketful. Great. It's quite a handy noun. But it can only be used in possessive constructions. You can't just have the noun basketful. It has to be something like my basketful or his basket full. Because the idea is if the basket is full of stuff, it's because someone put it there intentionally and they want to keep using it. It's it's clearly going to be someone's basket full. The other example they give for a noun where it's totally fine to not have it marked, it's not like all nouns have to do this, is a shirt. Because you can buy a shirt or loan someone a shirt. The ownership relationship isn't as important to the meaning. This is an example of how like I could make the same argument for shirt that like someone has clearly made this shirt. Shirts don't just grow on the bushes and come into appearance. But in this language, it's like, yeah, no, a shirt doesn't have to belong to someone, but a basketful does have to belong to some someone, which is this very sort of language specific aspect of that. Yeah. And where you draw the line between what is required to be possessed or in a language where it's not grammatically possible to use a possession construction, that's something you have to figure out for the particular language. Are there any other languages you know that have this these things that are obligatorily possessed or not possessed? I remember when I was learning Nepali, there is a particular set of like small things that you tend to just have with you where you can't use a possession construction. It's considered weird and a bit unnecessary. So instead of saying my pen or my change – or my cash, I would say the pen with me, or the cash with me, or the bag with me. And so is this sort of like the difference between like a disposable plastic, like shopping bag versus like a nice tote bag or a, a purse or a knapsack that you probably like put money into and it like invested, you know, you, you'd be attached to and you'd be sort of sad if you lost. Whereas if I lose a plastic shopping bag, I'm like, oh, well, I'll just get another one. It's fine. Yeah, I think if you had a beautiful fountain pen, it would be my pen. But if you just have a biro on you, you just say, it's with me. And uh, I remember one time using the, well, that's my, like, that's my bag for like a plastic 
shopping bag and people thought it was very funny that I would feel the need to exert ownership <laughs> over this kind of transient thing. So it's interesting that you can have both things that are sort of too big and important, like the moon, for one person to assert ownership over them, and also things like, I don't know, a safety pin, a cheap pen, like a plastic bag. Yeah. And we kind of had this in English as well. I could say, do you have a pen on you? Or have you got any money on you? Oh, and so you're sort of trying to separate me from the the concept of the of the pen of like, maybe I'll borrow your pen and it's just a cheap pen and I might not give it back. I mean, I'm definitely trying to separate you <laughs> from the money. That's why I'm trying to make you feel like it's not yours. It's just with you. Whereas to say like, oh, do you have a do you have a car on you by any chance that I could borrow? <laughs> and I think the important thing with these distinctions is you can come up with a meaning-based rationalization. And I definitely had to do that with Nepali to get my head around the construction. But at the end of the day, it's about what's grammatical and not grammatical in a language and the lengths you have to go to to try and make it feel like a grammatical thing in your head. So one type of grammatical distinction that a lot of languages have some version of is this idea that there are some elements that are intrinsically always possessable or in relationship to another entity, and there are some that have this sort of optional relationship. But this happens really differently depending on which language, which things go in this category or not. So something like your arm is very much attached to you. That relationship cannot be ended easily, I would like to say. So body parts are a really good example, even if some terrible circumstance or some like horrific horror movie type circumstance happens and it does get detached from your body, you're still feeling very attached to it in an emotional way, mm -hmm. even if it's not physically connected to you right now. And physical connection isn't the only thing because like family relationships are another kind of not ending relationship that you have. And family relationships are like, you're not just a grandmother, you're a grandmother to someone or several someones. Hmm. There's no being a grandmother in abstraction that exists without grandchildren to be a grandparent of. So in both of these, it, so in a language like Ojibwe, for example, which is an Algonquian language spoken in Canada, Ninik is my arm, but there's no context in which a person just says Nick to mean arm in abstract, mm -hmm. the way you can in English. Or Nukmis is my grandmother. Right. But there's no context in which you just say like, Ukmis, that's not a word that no one no one goes around saying that to just mean a grandmother in abstract. And they've got the little ungrammatical notations there. But sometimes languages actually do let you make this sort of fine-grained distinction between two different types of ways of possessing a noun. Hmm. So we have this example from Hawaiian where they actually use different two different ways to mark possession depending on whether it is this intrinsic association or it's this external separable association. Right. So if you say na'iwi o pua, this means pua's bones in pua's body. Pua is a person's name. Right. Definitely intrinsically attached, hard to end that relationship with your bones. Very much so. Yeah. But pua could also be eating a nice chicken dinner. Uh huh. And then you might have na'iwi a pua instead of o pua. And this could mean pua's bones as in the chicken bones that pua is eating. Ah. So like, pua, are you done with those bones yet? Or are you going to save them to make chicken stock with? They no longer belong to the chicken because the chicken is no more. They belong to pua, but in a separable way where pua could be like, actually, I'm not hungry for all of these. Would you like to have some? What a neat little pair to show that distinction. Yeah, it's this very sort of subtle distinction between what it means to own something in two different ways. And I think it's fair to say English doesn't have this as a, a core feature, because if you say something like, she has her father's eyes, okay, usually we mean that as, oh, she has the same colored eyes as her father. We could also imagine <laughs> a fairly horrific oh, no. <laughs> context in which she has acquired her father's eyes physically in her hand. Because if, if you were to say she has her father's book, that doesn't necessarily mean that like her book resembles her father's book. It probably means she she borrowed this book from her father. Yeah. But in the context of something like eyes, it's really context and our knowledge of how eyes work that enable this to, to happen. There's nothing grammatically distinct happening between those two there. 
I'm thinking of the children's book series Amelia Bedelia, where sometimes Amelia Bedelia takes on these very literal interpretations of what someone's said. And so I could picture Amelia Bedelia being like, oh, you want me to have my father's eyes? Okay. Plucks the eyeballs out. And you're like, Amelia Bedelia, no, don't do it. Okay. Yeah. We'll save that for the Amelia Bedelia horror fanfic community. (laughs) Free idea right there. So body parts and kinship terms Mm -hmm. are the most common types of meanings that are expressed by this grammatically different type of possession. But other things that sometimes have a special possession marking are social relationships, like a trading partner or a neighbor or a Mm -hmm. friend. So you're not, you can't just be a friend in isolation. You have to be a friend of someone or you have to be a neighbor of someone. Yeah, that makes sense. Also part whole relationships, Mm -hmm. like the tabletop is part of the table, that the top doesn't exist without the table also existing, the side of the table. Things that originate from someone, like your sweat or your voice. Mm -hmm. Again, hard to imagine them existing without a body to to put them into existence. Mental states and processes, like fear or minds, which only exist because someone gives rise to them. And also sometimes attributes like a name or an age, Mm -hmm. which you can sometimes conceive of as like, what does an age mean? Unless it's an age of someone, otherwise it's just a number. And someone's name is always attached to a someone. So that also makes sense. Yeah, I mean, sometimes you can say like, how many people do you know named John or something like that, which could could separate it out. But languages don't necessarily include all of these categories. These are just some that depending on the language, they're going to either group with this intrinsically possessed group or say, no, we can we can conceive of, of these as being potentially separate. I think it's very satisfying for the theme of this episode that the technical term for this is about whether something is unseparatable and therefore inalienable, or if something is separate or can be terminated in a relationship and therefore is alienable. Because you could also dress up as a spooky alien. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, that's entirely why. (laughs) Alienable possession is like a great spooky linguistics costume. Well, you could imagine the spooky aliens, you know, being able to detach their heads from their bodies and Mm. and move at a distance or something like this. This sort of headless horseman, dress up as Marie Antoinette and carry your own head around on a platter type of costume. Oh, I like that. And then most of the non-linguists will think you're a Marie Antoinette and most of the linguists will think you are (laughs) alienable possession. (laughs) Very good. Definitely we can save this for our linguist costume party where we dress up as our favorite linguistic examples. Because there are all kinds of relationships and they need to be navigated, languages that have this alienable, inalienable distinction can come up with really interesting ways of dealing with both of those relationships. So in Navajo, you have a word like milk that is intrinsically related to an individual. So if you were to say bibe, which is her milk, you can also have a form that is Abe, which is something's milk. It's handy if you don't need to know which particular cow or soybeans your milk came from. And then if she goes to the store and buys some milk, it's Abe. So this is like her something's milk. Yes. It's got both this unspecified aspect of like, well, the milk came from from some entity, but then also she's brought home the carton from the store. Yeah. If you're in a house with feeding parents... You really want to be clear when someone says, oh, that's her milk in the fridge. And Navajo conveniently makes that distinction. If it's her milk that she's bought, hands off, that's for her cup of tea, or if it's milk for the baby. Yeah, but it's got this interesting sort of double possession. So when we were doing research for this episode, Mm -hmm. I'm coming up with lots of fairly typical examples of possession. And I was very unsurprised to see these examples like Ojibwe and Navajo and Warani because this distinction between alienable and inalienable possession is very characteristic of languages of the Americas, North and South America. A lot of them have this particular distinction, even ones that linguists don't typically consider related in a historic sense. There is, I guess, enough language contact and various things that like lots of languages of this area have them. Mm -hmm. And then I read that French has this distinction. And I was like, hang on, I speak French. Hang on, you speak Speak French. Yeah. How have I never noticed that French had this distinction? And I'm familiar with the distinction and I'm I'm quite familiar with French. 
So this was a surprise to you. But it had never occurred to me (laughs) that French actually has this distinction. But it's there, and I've produced it. (laughs) Amazing. So how does it work in French? So in French, this is only with body parts. So this is a really good example of like, languages will sometimes like, pick up like one area of the stuff that can be intrinsically possessed. Mm -hmm. Like French doesn't even do it with kinship terms, which is another area that's super common. It's only body parts for French. Okay. So you can say something like, je me lave les mains, which means, literally means I wash myself the hands, Mm -hmm. but is the idiomatic way of saying, I wash my hands. Right. But you can only do this for body parts. I can say, je me lave les les cheveux, I wash myself the hair and other parts of the body. So there's no specific like apostrophe s equivalent possession thing in there it's just because it's a body part and it's myself and it's reflexive yeah Yeah. so it's it's i wash myself the hands it's not just i wash the hands it's it's like i wash myself the hands but if you want to say like i wash the horse yeah you would say something or like i wash my horse you would say je lave mon cheval right if you go around saying je me lave le cheval I washed myself the horse. It really starts to imply that the horse is part of me. Mm. Are you a centaur? <laughs> Maybe I'm a centaur in this situation. I refer to like my lower half as the horse. Whereas in English, like I washed my hands and I washed my horse. You're just using the my construction. It doesn't matter if it's a body part. I'm using like the same construction. Yeah, exactly. And I can't do this like if I have to give a child a bath. Mm hmm. I can say, like, je lave l'enfant or je lave mon enfant if it's, like, my kid. But if I say, like, je me lave Mm l'enfant. I washed myself child. Kid, yeah. Yeah. I think that, like, je me lave le bébé. Maybe if I was pregnant and the baby was in my belly and I was joking about washing my belly as if it was washing the kid or something. You're getting into very specific context to make sense. (laughs) Very specific scenarios. And I was texting some other friends who speak French because I was like, is this just me because I know that I sometimes have intuitions about French and sometimes I don't? Mm-hmm. But I was really getting, especially like with like, je me lave l'auto, I wash myself the car, which really implies that I'm in some sort of like Transformers mech suit situation where I am the car. <laughs> There's no other meaning of that. Right. What about something that's like really close to being a body part, but not quite? Like uh, if you had to wash your shadow. Well, okay, I, I don't okay, pragmatically I don't think I can wash my shadow, but I can see my shadow, and that's reflexive too. Okay, yeah. I'll be very kind and give you an example sentence that's almost <laughs> sensical. Sure. So I think I still have to say like je vois mon ombre. I can't say like je me vois l'ombre where like I see myself the shadow in the way I can say like je me vois le visage, I see myself the face. I think I can say that. Mm-hmm. And I did text a few people to check this. And I also did a Google search and there's lots of Google results for je vois mon ombre, but there are literally zero Google hits for je me vois l'ombre, yeah. which is like, I see myself the shadow, the the one that's like for body parts. There are literally zero Google hits, although I guess there'll be one once this episode is published. Amazing. <laughs> because we have transcripts. But yeah, it turns out that there are actually a bunch of European languages that do something similar with specifically body part possession. German does something similar. I wash myself the hands. Italian does something similar. I wash myself the hands. Mm. And it's it's specifically very body party, which sort of raises the question of why English doesn't do it. And to be honest, I don't know. We're missing out English. But yeah, so this is something that is also going on in other language families in this slightly different way where you don't have kinship terms involved. English doesn't have this, but we do have the benefit of having three completely different ways of marking possession. We have that plural S, we have of, and we have have. We have have. We have have. English possesses three (laughs) strategies. Let's start with apostrophe S. I like apostrophe S because it's really, really old as a possessive strategy when Mm. using in English. Old English had lots of suffixes on the ends of nouns that indicated their role in the sentence. And the surviving one, the one that's still kicking around, is this modern English apostrophe S. It's a relic. It's a zombie. (laughs) Uh, Definitely the zombies are, this is why pronouns, I mean, this is part of why pronouns, those possessive, mine, yours, theirs, that's why they also have those. And mine is slightly different because there used to be a whole bunch of different endings. Yeah. 
And this changing in the endings of the nouns to show what their relationship is to the rest of the sentence is a phenomenon known as case, mm -hmm. uh, which we're not going to get into in detail. It is the ways of marking things in relationship to other things. Yeah. Which is a thing you can see is really handy because there are all kinds of relationships we're navigating all the time of, you know, especially like family relationships. We all grow up in contexts where there are, you know, maybe kids or siblings or grandparents, and this all needs to be figured out in terms of like, this is my sister and that's my mom's daughter. I love this thing when you get with kids around age like three or so, where they're beginning to realize that the person like they might call mm -hmm. mom is like not a person everyone else also calls mom. Yeah. Because like other people might have their own mom or might not have a mom, but like is there, there's not everyone's mom is that one person. <laughs> and also who everyone is to everyone else. Like my sister is going to be their aunt. Right. There's this very fun example that I came across on Twitter where this guy says, this kid pointed at my dog and said to his mom, nice doggy, and then pointed at me and went, that's his dad. And the guy's like, technically, though, as my dog used to stay with my granny and granda, and they refer to themselves as his ma and da, the dog is actually my uncle. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad he's taking this uh, relationship very seriously and triangulating it within the family space. So what's interesting about this ending situation is that the Old English ending was yes on for for the possessive for a lot of the nouns, but some of the other nouns had other endings as well. Mm -hmm. And by the 16th century, this yes ending got generalized to all of the nouns. Yeah. And then gradually the spelling yes remained, but in many words, the letter E was no longer being pronounced. Oh, so by the 16th century, it was the way it's pronounced now. Basically, yeah. So instead of having like cat catches for the cat's tail, you just have cat cats, much like we have now. Although there are still some words in English, like words ending in S or another sibilant sound that still have that ES ending, like the fox's tail. <laughs> so printers started copying the French practice of substituting this apostrophe for this letter E that wasn't pronounced anymore. Ah. So that apostrophe is actually a ghost, keeping with our haunted episode thing. <laughs> it is a ghost of an E that once uh, was there. Hmm, spooky. Spooky. But it's pronounced at this point the same thing as the plural, like the cat's tail versus I saw two cats is pronounced the same. And so like this apostrophe, if you get confused about apostrophe usage, you can blame these early modern English printers. Because honestly, this situation was not necessary, and we actually would have been fine with no apostrophe at all because this works fine in the spoken language. It even created a bit more confusion because there was some point, like a century after the apostrophe, and people started assuming that the S was his as like the other possessive form that finished in an S. And so you found yeah. people saying things like St. James, his park, rather than St. James's park. Exactly. Like, it's just been the source of so much unnecessary confusion. And like, modern English speakers sure don't think of it as like, oh, it's just this short form of this thing that existed. Because like, we don't remember that this used to be an ES thing. That was hundreds of years ago. Yeah. But this does help once you've learned these very annoying rules. It does help us identify it, at least to talk about it in the possessive form, which brings us to of. Which is our second possessive construction. And in Old English meant away or away from. Is that – so wait, is of related to off? Because that also feels like what off means. Apparently, yeah. Off was like an emphatic form of 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 – and then they diverged into their own little lines. Oh, neat. Hmm. But that from gives you an idea of how this locational sense of the construction works. And I feel like of gets used to translate de from old, or old French or de from Latin, so that often the English constructions that have an of in them feel maybe a little bit more Latin-y or french -y, a bit more formal maybe. Yeah, I can see that. Like, 
the Leaning Tower of Pisa definitely sounds fancier than Pisa's Leaning Tower. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, you mean we could have been staying Liberty Statue instead of the Statue of Liberty this whole time? Oh, that does not work for me. And I think it's partly, partly because it's a set phrase, but also partly because that apostrophe S does just sound a little bit more informal. And maybe because the of has this a little bit more of a tendency to be locational Mm. in the like from sense, which is there etymologically rather than just associated with. But I I do find it fun to just think about examples of set phrases that either have of or apostrophe S in and see how they feel when you swap them. Hmm. Like China's Great Wall. Or Giza's Great Pyramid. Paradox of Zeno. The Law of Murphy. (laughs) As we were preparing this episode, I just spent several days going around my life noticing these and flipping them in my mind, so I hope that I have now infected everybody with that. The distinction between apostrophe S and of constructions can also give you, as an English speaker, a little bit of a alienable, inalienable distinction sense. So for these kind of constructions, you can say something like the brother of Mary. Which is just as good as Mary's brother. Those sound the same to me. Which is just as good as Mary's brother. But if you had something that is more alienable and less of an intrinsic relationship, something like the bat of Mary. Versus like Mary's bat. Mary could have a pet bat, but the bat of Mary... I'm just getting a little bit confused in the way that I wasn't with the brother of Mary. Yeah. And so uh, it's been argued that this is because kinship relationships are more intrinsic and inalienable and closer than a kind of general possession relationship. And that's why it sounds less natural. Our final possessive structure in English is the use of have as a verb. So in English, we can say something like, I have some candy. This is fine. Mm-hmm. But some languages don't have a specific verb that indicates possession. They instead use a different strategy to say like a full sentence that's a, that's a possessive. So the one that I'm most familiar with, and this one happens in Scottish Gaelic and also Hindi, which are two Indo-European languages spoken very far from each other, mm-hmm. which translates something more like at me is some candy. Yeah, that's kind of what that Nepali with me is a pen construction is doing. And Nepali and Hindi are very closely related languages. So that makes sense. There's other constructions like mine is some candy Hmm. or some candy is mine. And I think this is similar to what Finnish does. Yeah. Where you have a possessive, but but not in the verb. And there's an example from Tondano, which is an Austronesian language spoken in northern Sulawesi. The broad translation that you might use in English is the man has two houses. But it's something more like, as far as the man is concerned, there are two houses. Right. So it's kind of like the man and then you're drawing attention to the man as the one doing the possessing. And then the thing that's being possessed is just there. The man is like the topic of the sentence, and then and then there are two houses, and so you infer this relationship between them. And so you could you can paraphrase it in very sort of long English ways, like as far as the man is concerned. <laughs> yeah, speaking about the man with regard to the man, I like to think of it also in sort of email mm-hmm. style, as like re me there is candy. I like that. I think that's getting much more at the grammatical structure of it. Because like these topicalizing words tend to be really short because they're used a lot in languages that have them. Mm. So I just think that saying like as far as X is concerned makes it sound really clunky. Or if you're just like re the man, candy. It gets forward how how concise this can also be. We know that candy doesn't own the man. We know it's the man that has the candy. Well, and if you wanted to convey the inverse, you'd have to say like re the candy. The man. It's another horror movie premise. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Ooh, spooky candy possessing people. (laughs) You can also do things like I am with some candy or me and a candy, me and candy too. So these sorts of with styles of possessive and even just putting the, the two nouns next to each other and again, inferring this type of relationship. Maybe the ordering has some sort of effect like the child candy and you can infer a sort of adjective relationship with them. Hmm. It's also worth noting for languages that do have a verb, like English have, it's usually from some kind of verb that indicates physical control or handling. Hmm. So in English, 
have has become our verb, but in other languages, it can be a verb that's more like take or grasp or hold or carry. And you can kind of see how all of those indicate some kind of possessing relationship that then goes on to be a general possession verb. And and have itself comes from a Proto-Indo-European root that means like to grasp, cap meaning to grasp. All of this is just a really nice reminder that you can start with this general idea of a relationship between two things, but languages are going to use a whole bunch of different strategies for putting that into the grammar. Yeah. And possession is like is the most common word used to describe this in English, even though it has this connotation of being very possessive about something or this maybe capitalistic possession and ownership or being haunted. <laughs> Another word that's used to describe this in a in a formal grammar sense is genitive, mm-hmm. which comes from a root meaning like to generate or progeny, like give birth to. Okay. One of those relationships that we've seen a lot of, like yeah. interpersonal relationships. Exactly. So this category of relationship is often named for sort of one of its prototypical relationships, and then there's a whole bunch of other things that get subsumed into that category because the same grammatical construction, you pick one of its sort of prototypical uses and then you extend it to a whole bunch of other types of meaning-based relationships, even though the grammar-based one is the same across the whole category. And I think it's always good to remember that there are all of these different kinds of relationships that get caught up within this one grammatical category. And if I say, you know, they're my student or they're my child, it doesn't mean I'm they are my possession in a, you know, capitalistic ownership of way. It's just a way of indicating this relationship between us. And in fact, if someone is your student or your child, they also have a possessive relationship with you. You're their advisor or their mentor or their professor or their parent. And so in many cases, these possessive relationships have a really important element of reciprocity that where each other's friends or neighbors or that parent child or mentor mentee have an element where the possession goes both ways because it situates us in some of the ways we relate to each other. So languages have lots of different ways of expressing these types of relationships between beings and elements of the world, but it's very, very common cross-linguistically to have some way of doing this category of relationships, which suggests that it's something that's, that's really important to all of us and part of our shared humanity. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on all the podcast platforms or lingthusiasm.com, and you can get transcripts of every episode on lingthusiasm.com slash transcripts. You can follow at Lingthusiasm on all the social media sites. You can get scarves with lots of linguistics patterns on them, including Gabagai, IPA, branching tree diagrams, Booba and Kiki, and our favorite esoteric Unicode symbols, plus other Lingthusiasm merch, like our new Ask Me About Linguistics stickers, and more people have read the text on this shirt than I have t-shirts at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. My social media and blog is Superlinguo. Links to my social media can be found at gretchenmcculloch.com. My blog is allthingslinguistic.com, and my book about internet language is called Because Internet. Lingthusiasm is able to keep existing thanks to the support of our patrons. If you want to get an extra Lingthusiasm episode to listen to every month, our entire archive of bonus episodes to listen to right now, or if you just want to help us keep the show running ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm or follow the links from our website. Patrons can also get access to our Discord chat room to talk with other linguistics fans and be the first to find out about new merch and other announcements. Recent bonus episodes include alien languages and whether we could figure them out, a behind the scenes on Tom Scott's language files, which we collaborated on, and why the word do in English is so weird. Can't afford to pledge? That's okay, too. We also really appreciate it if you can recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone in your life who's curious about language. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gorn. Our senior producer is Claire Gorn. Our editorial producer is Sarah Doppiarella. Our production assistant is Martha Tsutsui Billens. And our editorial assistant is John Crook. Our music is Ancient City by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic! Lingthusiastic!